So in our model, we assume that um, people do the best they can individually, uh, right? So we assume that all households are going to maximize their utility subject to their budget constraint. Um, but it's pretty natural to also assume that there is a minimum amount of cooperation so that when uh, pairs meet, uh, when two people meet, they are going to do the best they can for the pair. Um, so if you want, you will have, uh, you can think of maximizing utility as an individual rationality, but we could also assume that there is a pairwise rationality that um, when two people meet and they can do something that will create some surplus for the pair, they are going to do, to do it. Or conversely, if two people meet and what they are going to do will generate negative surplus for the pair, they are not going to do it. Um, and uh, so this concept uh, of minimum cooperation that pairs do the best they can for the pair is what we call bilateral efficiency. Um, and if bilateral efficiency was violated, um, what that means is that uh, pairs of people would engage in, uh, in behavior that hurt them uh, as a pair and therefore with a minimum of cooperation, uh, you know, with a minimum of cooperation, they could decide not to do it and both be better off. Um, so basically, if bilateral efficiency was violated, there would be Pareto improvement that would be available uh, just within the pair. Uh, both people in the pair would be better off uh, in that case. Um, conversely, if you have you know, actions that are available that generate a surplus to the pair, but the pair doesn't do it, well, you know, again, you would have Pareto improvement available because the pair could just cooperate a little bit more and decide to actually do this thing, and they would be both uh, be better off. So, you know, it seems pretty natural in the real world, if there's a minimum of, uh, of cooperation, uh, bilateral efficiency sh should be respected. And because we're trying to build models of the real world, um, it seems natural to uh, impose that bilateral efficiency is respected in all interactions uh, between pairs of people. Again, because if it was not, you would have simple Pareto improvement available, um, where both uh, both people in the pair would be better off. Uh, now, the reason why I'm talking about this is that, in fact, uh, in many models of price or wage rigidity, uh, bilateral efficiency is not satisfied. Um, so this minimum uh, amount of cooperation uh, doesn't seem to occur, uh, you know, which, which is a problem and which, which has been used uh, often in the literature to criticize uh, models of uh, price and wage rigidity because they do not even satisfy this, uh, you know, seemingly a reasonable criterion of bilateral efficiency. So bilateral efficiency, we said it means two things. If a pair is on the one hand, if a pair meets and can do something that generates a joint surplus, they do it. And conversely, if a pair meets and might do something that generates a negative joint surplus, they do not do it. They agree to not do it. Okay, so you can think of bilateral efficiency as a uh, minimum
amount of cooperation. Uh, in your society. And of course, if bilateral efficiency is violated, it means that there are Pareto, as, as we had just discussed, if bilateral so it means that pairs take action that actually lower their joint well-being um, and so if they didn't take that action the joint well-being could be improved so it means that there would be Pareto improvements available you could take that extra joint well-being and give a little bit to both parties and they would both be better off so if bilateral efficiency is violated the key thing is that uh, there are Pareto improvements available. Um, and so if there's a minimum amount of cooperation in your society, you wouldn't let this uh, Pareto improvements go by. You would uh, grasp this Pareto improvement and, and, and enact the Pareto improvement. Um, and so, um, so in our model, bilateral efficiency will always be respected. We uh, show that, but a key problem historically with uh, models in which you have some price or wage rigidity, which here in our model we don't have to do it, but one option would have to have price norms that are uh, rigid, and we'll see that that's the most realistic uh, assumption, both at the micro and macro level. Um, but uh, historically, the model of uh, price and wage rigidity actually they were not bilaterally efficient. So, you know, that, 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 and that was used to criticize this model. So there are two aspects to this argument. Um, so traditional models of um, price and wage rigidity do not satisfy bilateral efficiency. Um, and so, yes, so that was used, uh, that has been used to criticize these models uh, of price or wage rigidity. So um, what are the two aspects of the argument? So the old the old critique is a Barrow 1977 critique. Of models with uh, wage rigidity. Um, so what was the Barrow critique? Well, so in the old models of wage rigidity, you know, in, in Keynesian models, uh, in disequilibrium models of, of wage rigidity, what would happen is that in you know your wages are fixed, and if you have a bad shock, say your labor demand is going to shift in, and so because the wage is fixed, uh, firms is going to you know if you have a negative labor demand shock, your wage is fixed, um, firms are going to fire workers. Um, uh, and, and these workers are going to become uh, are going to become unemployed. So something like this. Um, okay, and what Barrow noted is that um, usually the unemployed, um, you know, are quite miserable. And in fact, usually in the long run, the relationship between the firm and the worker would produce a positive surplus. And so it doesn't, you know, it's bilaterally inefficient to, because in the short run, you have, you know, a temporary negative shock to your demand uh, to fire all these workers because, you know, because you do not reduce the wage. Also, in the, in the long run, the worker and the firm would have generated uh, a positive surplus. And that's in part because, of course, the outside option of the workers are pretty bad because unemployment is such a bad state. Um, and and so what Barrow said is that well that's bilaterally inefficient you have this long term relationship that can produce a positive surplus like why would you break the relationship just because um, 
the, you know, the wage, just because you don't want to reduce the wage, what would make sense is that since that relationship generates a positive surplus, it would make more sense for the firm and the worker to sit down, agree to keep the relationship going because it creates a surplus by lowering the wage a little bit. So in a situation like this, and keeping the worker employed. So in a situation like this, you can see that that's a Pareto improvement because of course the firm is better off because the firm is able to uh, keep the worker at a lower wage than, uh, than before. And of course the worker is better off because um, of course the worker is paid a bit less, but the thing is that if the wage wasn't lower, the worker would have been unemployed. And so if you compare being unemployed with being employed with a slightly lower wage, of course you prefer to be employed with a slightly lower wage. So here there is a Pareto improvement. You can see that in fact, in the real world, the firm can be made better off and uh, the worker can be made better off. And that's because there is a positive surplus. So there is a wage that's low enough so that the firm is happy to keep the worker and uh, the worker is happy to keep working. You know, if you have a wage that splits the surplus to leave both parties with a, to split the joint surplus to leave both parties with a positive individual surplus. Um, and so what Bauer was saying is that, well, these models, you know, they don't, uh, if you just assume that the wage is fixed and firms just fire workers like that, although they could create a positive surplus, these models violate bilateral efficiency. And so it's, it's unlikely that, that they capture what actually happens in the real world. Um, So his point was that firing workers because of wage rigidity violates bilateral efficiency. The idea was that firm and worker could both be better off by renegotiating a lower uh, wage. And of course, here's the underlying assumption is that the long-term relationship uh, between worker and firm uh, generates a positive surplus, which, you know, if, which is likely to be the case if the worker was higher in the first place, you know, if you have a temporary downturn, given the, you know, that's just maybe a year, maybe two years, whereas employment relationships are very long, you know, they last possibly decades. Um, so if a worker was generating a surplus for the firm, you know, just a temporary blip in demand, you know, shouldn't make the worker uh, suddenly uh, useless to the firm, you know. Uh, so, you know, if these are just like temporary ups and downs in business, and if at one point in time, it made sense to have the worker for the long run, then it's very likely that it also makes sense to keep the worker when you have a temporary dip in, uh, in demand. Um, so that was, Barrow's, uh, that was Barrow's criticism, that you have all these Pareto improvements that are available. Uh, in this model, and so it seems unlikely that it captures what really happens. And so that actually was a big, um, this criticism was uh, quite powerful and it led uh, kind of to the dis, uh, demise of this, of models of uh, price and wage rigidity and kind of, it really accelerated the transition in the late 70s from this equilibrium model towards uh, the RBC model. So that's quite a powerful uh, criticism. Um, so here, how is that related to this notion uh, of bilateral efficiency that we mentioned? Well, uh, it's exactly uh, related to, uh, <coughs> to the first point here, that if a pair meets and can do something that generates a joint surplus, they do it. Uh, and so here, that's exactly what happens. If the pair, the pair has met the worker and the firm, and they can do something that generates a joint surplus, which is, you know, to reduce, uh, to reduce the wage and actually uh, be in a productive relationship. Uh, 
So here, firm and worker can generate positive join surplus by continuing to uh, work together at lower wage. Okay. Um, and so it seems unlikely that uh, the worker on the firm, they would let that opportunity for a Pareto improvement uh, go by. And here's the key insight is that uh, if an action for the pair can generate a positive surplus, there is always a price at which both parties will be happy to take part in that action. Because if there is a joint positive surplus, you know, if the price is just at the right level, you can redistribute the uh, benefit from that surplus between the two parties so that each party has a little bit uh, of the surplus. You know, basically, it means that by taking an action, an action suddenly there's an apple pie that, hap that happens. And by, you know, cutting the pie somewhere in the middle, both parties can live with uh, a slice of pie. Uh, so your price decides how big of a slice each, uh, you know, the buyer and the seller take away. Uh, but if the pie exists, you can always cut, you know, if you cut the pie somewhere in the middle, both parties will be happy to go home with a slice of the pie instead of going home with nothing at all. Um, so if there is a joint surplus to share, it means that there is a price, you know, price or a wage such that both parties <coughs> go home with a positive uh, with a positive surplus. So that was the idea here of the barrow critic. Now so this is a criticism that said that here people uh, do not take you know an action that would benefit them both. Then there is another more modern uh, variant of this criticism of model of price and wage rigidity. And that's, uh, that's a criticism by uh, Ho and Rio's rule in 2020, uh, a critique of uh, New Keynesian models. Uh, with um, Calvo uh, pricing. And so here what they noticed is that, uh, what they no so, you know, when you have Calvo pricing and Calvo wage setting, uh, so on the pricing side, what happens that firms have to keep selling their goods at the same price for a long time until the Calvo ferry comes and tells them that they can change their price. On the worker side, what happens is that households have to keep selling their labor at the same wage until the Calvo ferry comes and tell them they can change their wage. But what happens is because the Calvo ferry arrives uh, with a poison process, you have some firms that keep their price for you know infinitely long time at the same level. You have some households that keep their wage for an infinitely long time at the same level. And then what happens is that as the economy evolves, these prices and these wages they may stay the same for a very, very long time. And you arrive in a situation where actually um, the firm is going to sell at a price that's below the marginal cost of production. Uh, households are going to sell their labor at a wage that's below the marginal rate of substitution uh, between you know, uh, labor and uh, you know, leisure and consumption. Um, so, you know, so what happens is that here, these actions are bilaterally, bilaterally inefficient because, you know, consumers, they buy the good 
at a price such that price is equal to marginal utility, but then the price is below the marginal cost of production. So you're in a situation uh, on the product market, you're in a situation in this new Keynesian model, you're in a situation where uh, sometimes the marginal utility of consumption is less than the marginal cost of production of the consumption. And so if you're, you know, you produce something at some marginal cost and the marginal utility you get from it is less than that. Uh, so here, you know that you have actually a negative joint surplus. Um, And so what that means is that uh, actually the firm and the customers, they will be better off not doing this transaction um, because the transaction gen generates a negative joint surplus. And in fact, what would happen is that if the firm and the customers had decided to call it off and don't do the transaction, if they cooperated a little bit to not do the transaction, the customer would be indifferent because you know they buy, a, they buy the good at the margin the price equals the marginal utility. So, you know, if you don't pay the price and don't enjoy the marginal utility, you're indifferent. But the firm is strictly better off because the price doesn't cover the marginal cost. So the firm is making a negative profit. Um, so basically, here what would happen is that you would have Pareto improvement by not doing this transaction. Firm and customer better off by not trading. So here there is a Pareto improvement. The same happens like in this new Keynesian. So this is not, of course, not all transactions because, you know, different firms have different prices based on when the Calvo ferry last visited them. But you have a, you have a set of transactions that are actually uh, that are actually bilaterally inefficient. And the point of the Juan Rios rule paper is to show that actually it's quite a significant set of transactions that violate bilateral efficiency. Um, and so the labor market, what happens is that sometimes for households that have kept their wage at the same level for a long time, um, the marginal product of labor, so what the firm does with the labor is actually less than the marginal rate of um, substitution, which is, you know, the marginal cost, uh, the, you know, the marginal, the marginal rate of substitution between um, leisure and consumption, which is um, the marginal cost of supplying labor for the households. And so again here, so basically the marginal cost of supplying that labor is going to be more than what the labor can actually produce. Um, and so again, you'll have a negative joint surplus here. And so here again, uh, the firm and workers can be better off by not trading. You know, because the firm pays the worker in the new Keynesian model, the way that they pay them is equal to the marginal product. So if you can't hire a worker at the margin, you're indifferent. You don't pay the wage and you don't produce, but that's you're completely different. For the household, though, and the worker here, because their wage is strictly less than the uh, marginal product of labor, well, actually, they'll be strictly better off by not working. So in a sense, here, you have many situations with the Calvo Ferry in which people are working too much. They are working more than what they would like to work. Similarly, firms are producing too much. They are producing more than they would like to produce. And with a bit of cooperation, these trades could be called off and you know, uh, everybody would be better if you would have Pareto improvement. So that's a criticism of the Calvo uh, pricing that uh, Juan Rios Rule made. Uh, so the bottom line is that uh, in, the, in the new Keynesian model with Calvo pricing, uh, there are many Pareto improvements. Uh, that are uh, not implemented. So it shows a total lack 
of just cooperation between customers and firms and uh, firms and workers, uh, you know, which which is problematic. We would think that in practice, this type of trades would not uh, occur. Um, but here they but here they occur. So um, bottom line is that. In standard model of price weight rigidity, is there's a disequilibrium model or the new Keynesian model with scalable pricing. Uh, that's kind of the conclusion. Uh, bilateral efficiency is often violated. Uh, and so that, that's problematic. Standard model of price. Uh, bilateral inefficiencies occur. Um, so as Barrow showed and more recently Juan uh, Rios Road showed, and so that's problematic. And so we'll see that in contrast, uh, <coughs> in contrast in our model of Slack, um, all trades are going to be uh, all trades are going to be bilaterally. Uh, efficient. Any meeting is going to be bilaterally efficient.